Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W. We continue our discussion now of growing sectionalism in the nation leading up to the years of the Civil War. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about the aftermath of the Compromise of 1850, responses and retaliations to some of its various parts, including most especially the national uproar over the Fugitive Slave Law. As I mentioned in the previous lecture, the Compromise of 1850 included in part a much more severe fugitive slave law that not only allowed Southerners to pursue their escaped slaves into the North and try to recapture them, but also mandated that Northerners assist in this process. There was fierce reaction to the fugitive slave law, particularly in the North. Individuals even average Northerners who might not have had strong feelings about slavery either way, hated being told what to do, and particularly by the South. The voices of abolitionists grew even more prominent in the wake of the Fugitive Slave Law. In particular, Frederick Douglass, who I've discussed several times previously, and who for a time was pursued under this new Fugitive Slave Law until he purchased his freedom. Uh, Douglas said in 1853, the only way to make the fugitive slave law a dead letter is to make a half dozen or more dead kidnappers. The fugitive slave law also led to an increased prominence for the Underground Railroad and other efforts to assist slaves who were trying to escape from the South. And several states passed personal liberty laws to intervene between the fugitive uh, slave law, the federal law. State institutions and officials were prohibited from helping to recover fugitive slaves. So let's talk about a few of these elements a little bit in more detail. So just to reiterate how harsh this new fugitive slave law was, it created a federal force who could go into northern states to assist slave owners in pursuit of their escaped slaves and even allowed them to deputize average citizens and so at its worst you had these sort of gangs of roving southerners uh, roaming through the streets of northern cities in search of uh, escaped slaves in some cases of course they did manage to recapture their escaped slaves in others uh, they mistakenly or perhaps intentionally grabbed free blacks off the streets and brought them to the South. And those slaves who were recaptured had no rights to a jury trial. And so many of them were uh, returned or confined to plantations and in some cases unjustly. Northern resistance to the fugitive slave law took many forms one of which was to heighten their assistance of the so-called Underground Railroad, which was a network of safe houses and hiding places uh, which assisted runaway slaves making their way from the south to the north and even into Canada. The most famous conductor on the Underground Railroad was, of course, Harriet Tubman, an escaped slave herself, who made at least 19 trips back to the South to lead other slaves to freedom, including many of her family members. Um, and while Harriet Tubman is the most famous, there were many other conductors uh, and people who were willing to assist uh, escaped slaves along the way. No one knows for certain how many slaves uh, escaped to achieve their freedom during this time. But the estimates are probably lower than uh, angry slaveholders and uh, Southerners wanted to believe at that time. Um, historians estimate somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000 slaves escaping from the South between 1830 and 1860, which is a considerable number, but you're talking about a few dozen, uh, maybe a few hundred in any given year. Uh, it was not hordes of thousands of slaves uh, leaving the South every year, even though Southerners uh, exaggerated the, the extent of this problem. Southerners particularly hated the personal liberty laws, which were passed by nine northern states in the aftermath of the Fugitive Slave Law, 
and they argued that so that northerners had to assist southerners uh, in upholding this federal law which leads us to a few sort of curious contradictions in southern opposition to the personal liberty laws if we are talking about states rights as one of the key issues during this period well, personal liberty laws were northern laws passed by the states. Uh, and at the same time, southerners who, on the one hand, argued in favor of states' rights, were now arguing that the federal fugitive slave law held sway. So there's a bit of a, a complication in making the argument that southern states were all about states' rights in this period when in fact their stance on the fugitive slave law was completely the opposite of states' rights. The fugitive slave law brought arguments about the nature of slavery out into the open and compelled many northerners, who up to that point might have stood on the sidelines and not had strong feelings either way, into opposition against slavery. Again, they resented Southerners making their way into northern cities and streets. But also, the vivid images of slaves being grabbed off of the streets to be returned to their former masters really struck a negative chord for many Northerners, who, again, maybe up to that point had not paid much attention. But now, uh, the abhorrent institution of slavery was literally making its appearance in the streets of northern cities. And so this was one mechanism that sparked further resistance to slavery and again is going to deepen the divide between north and south. Northern opposition to slavery was also hastened by the publication of many books. I've already described uh, in previous lectures some of the slave narratives that were published during this time. But certainly one of the most influential, if not the most influential book of this era was called Uncle Tom's Cabin, published in 1852 by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uh, and Stowe was herself an avowed abolitionist and came from a family of abolitionists. The book depicted a harsh and debilitating form of slavery. In other words, it was rooted in reality. It led many Northerners to grow even more opposed to the institution, while Southerners became incensed over the book. This is one of the best-selling books in American history. It sold over 300,000 copies in its first year, and more than 3 million copies total at a time when the population of the country was only about 25 million. So you see these various responses to the Fugitive Slave Law. And yet, in the end, the Fugitive Slave Law must be deemed to have been largely effective for its purpose. By 1856, some 200 blacks had been arrested under the law, and only about 15 were rescued from capture. Uh, many of these were heart-wrenching cases that, again, brought Northerners into further opposition to slavery. In a few cases in Boston in the early 1850s, angry mobs could still not prevent the return of captured slaves. And so these cases provided a powerful force for the anti-slavery movement. 